Kenneth, thanks for joining me today. Now, you've worked extensively in the area of drug development for, for quite a number of years. Tell me a little bit about your background, just to begin with, please. Well, my background is in pharmacology. I hold a faculty appointment at Tufts University School of Medicine in, at, uh, in Boston. Um, my group, the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, I believe is the only academic group that's committed to the exploring the scientific, economic, regulatory, and political issues that affect pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical innovation. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary staff, and uh, we, we publish quite a bit in peer-reviewed journals. We do a lot of presentations, and we hold courses and other roundtables and forums to uh, provide information that we think will help enlighten the, the debate about improving the drug development process. So you've got a really good vantage point of the changes which are taking place. And how would you summarize the key changes that you've seen in drug development for pharma over maybe the last 20 years or so? Well, I've been with the group for 25 years, so I've had an opportunity to look at changes in the industry over that time period and some of the challenges that they're confronted with. And I'd say over the last 10 years or so, um, what the major challenges for the industry is a drug development process that remains extremely expensive, um, risky, and time-consuming. We have a reimbursement environment, or sometimes referred to as a fourth hurdle, uh, that's in increasingly restrictive. Uh, it's more and more difficult to get the right price for your drug and to be included in uh, drug formularies, and that's in particular now in the United States with health care reform and all of the concerns about the overall health care bill. Um, sure. Patents on many high revenue generating products are expiring, and products are always losing their patent life. That's gone on ever since um, they, they began having patents. But the problem now is that the industry doesn't have many products to come behind those new products, uh, those products that are going off patent. And I think the, the, the final issue for the industry is that the regulatory environment, especially within the last 10 years, has become extremely um, uh, restrictive and um, much more risk averse. And that's not just in the United States, that's in Europe as well. I think regulatory authorities are shifting the balance from um, uh, from a more risk avert from a more uh, get drugs on the market and, and exploit whatever benefits there are to being more risk averse about allowing products on the market that may eventually have safety issues. Sure. So when you bear all of that in mind, what kind of success rates are you seeing for pharma in terms of getting drugs to market, and what's the impact on costs also of getting new drugs onto the market? I'd say su success rates is an area that industry has been focusing on for at least two decades. It's, it's not uncommon to go into a company and say, we're putting all of our resources and efforts into improving overall success rates, and yet despite all that energy, the industry has not been – uh, particularly successful uh, in improving their own success rates. Based on the most recent numbers that we've put out, and this is in a published article in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, last March, the overall success rate for new molecular entities is 16%. And of course, that hides the fact that there are significant differences across different therapeutic areas. So in areas like anti-infectives, systemic anti-infectives, where endpoints are fairly straightforward and drugs tend to be given over short periods of time, the success rate is around 24%. But in areas where it, the endpoints are more difficult to measure and drugs may be given over a lifetime, for example, in the central nervous system or neurodegenerative disorders area, success rates are just above 8%. So to start a drug development process with only 8% of your products eventually reaching the marketplace is an extremely risky process. And it's Absolutely. driving a lot of companies to actually look outside of the CNS area for, um, to conduct, to try to bring new products to market. And underpinning those kind of success rates, and I guess the fairly low success rates we're seeing, do you, do you think there's a decline in innovation? Or is it the bars just got higher? Across the industry, it's clear that the number of new products that are reaching the marketplace are not enough to sustain the R&D 
uh, within this industry. In other words, it may not necessarily be that the overall productivity of the industry has declined. We're not seeing numbers of new product approvals that are that much different from what we saw in the early 1990s and through most of the 1980s. The difference now is that the overall cost to develop those products has gone up at a very dramatic pace. And therefore, the number of products that have reached the marketplace recently is just not enough to sustain that rapid growth in R&D. In other words, it's not a productivity problem for the industry as much as it's a business model problem for the industry. And I think that that's what we're seeing now. And of course, pharma tends to look at, across the portfolio and tends to try and assess the risk involved in particular assets. What do you see as the major risks involved in that development process for pharma? Well, the major, major risk in the drug development process is maintaining a diverse enough portfolio so that companies can actually experience some failures in, say, biologics or vaccines or in new molecular entities versus follow-on uh, innovation. Um, the, the issue for the industry right now is diversifying risk within their portfolio. How companies are doing that from our perspective, from the perspective of my group, is a fascinating experience to watch because I think industry right now is struggling with determining what the appropriate model is for the diversification of risk. We see some right. companies that are restricting the number of, their, of, um, of different areas they're investigating. They're trying to eliminate everything but pharma R&D, for example. And you have other companies that are taking the exact opposite approach, which is to limit their pharma R&D and invest more heavily in other types of functions that they hope will diversify their risk. It's not clear at this point what the best approach will be. Right. Now, anecdotally, one of the things I hear, and I'm sure you've heard this, is that this kind of perception that small biotech is more innovative, is more effective at drug development than big pharma. Is that something you would agree with from your observations? We actually don't see much evidence that biotech is more efficient. And I know that from big pharma's perspective, there is this, um, this view of, of biotech as being highly flexible and uh, less risk averse and, and more efficient in bringing products to market. And I think a lot of biotech executives like, would like uh, the pharma community to believe that as well. The fact of the matter is, if we look at the overall time, cost, and risk of drug development, the biopharmaceutical products don't fare necessarily better than the products that are generally developed by big pharma. So we don't see that. What we do see, though, and I think part of the reason why uh, small companies are attractive to big pharma is the ability of smaller companies to avoid the silos that big pharma uh, is always grappling with. So you have regulatory people that may be involved in the preclinical process that are also involved in clinical and may actually deal with marketing and sales. You have um, right. chemists that are involved with the process right through to the marketing of the product. You have groups working together in a collaborative way that can see a product reach the marketplace, and you don't have that pass off from silo to silo, which I think a lot of companies have viewed as a, uh, a point of inefficiency in the drug development process. Mm -hmm. And they really haven't figured out how to, how to remedy that. So how are you seeing pharma adapting to coping with this changing environment and the increasing challenges? Well, I think what pharma is trying to do is to find a new model for R&D. And we see it in different ways. In some companies, uh, they are divesting certain functions. We see this in Lilly, which is now has now created uh, an entity called Chorus, where um, compounds from Lilly's portfolio are sent out to Chorus from candidate selection all the way until proof of concept, and then Chorus outsources all of that work. Uh, and then at, at the end of a proof of concept period. Lilly can determine whether they want to bring that product, that candidate, back into their portfolio. We also yeah. see in AstraZeneca uh, an outsourcing of active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API. 
We see in Bristol-Myers Squibb an outsourcing of pharmacovigilance. Sanofi Aventis is now outsourcing large parts of their process. So I think the divesting of certain functions and what's also referred to as functional outsourcing is a way that industry is trying to cope. Another way that industry is trying to deal with, with, with the inefficiency and the difficulties of the process of drug development is to partner more than they have in the past. And that includes partnerships with academic institutions and public-private partnerships and patient groups, and also partnerships with each other in a way that we've never seen before. So we have Absolutely. large companies working with each other to screen compounds and to try to find a more efficient mechanism for bringing these products to the marketplace. Okay. And if we just start to look forwards a bit now, are there any key... I guess, game changes, environmental game changes that you could see evolving to impact on the drug development process? Well, I'm not sure that there are too many game changers. The, the, the challenge really resides in the hands of the industry. The most important issue for the industry right now is to get a handle on the drug development process itself. It is wildly inefficient. Uh, it's extremely time-consuming. It's the risk levels are enormous, and the cost of bringing those products to market is gigantic and growing. Um, this is something that for an industry that relies on these products to generate the revenues to sustain their own growth is absolutely imperative that they get a handle on this. And, in, and the earnings within the companies reflect the fact that investors don't believe industry is able to manage this process. So I'm not sure that there are any specific game changers. Um, I don't. I see government in the United States and to some degree in Europe through the Innovative Medicines Initiative trying to help industry by developing new biomarkers, by identifying new tools to improve research and discovery and better screens. But at the end of the day, it's still industry that holds in its hands the key to improving its own performance. Right. So I guess finally, if you were to look further forward and visualize where you'd see the drug development model evolving for pharma in the future, what do you think it will what do you think it will look like? I think that the diversification of risk across different stakeholders is going to be critical moving forward. I'm often asked when I speak to companies or speak within academic institutions where will the drugs of the future come from? And my sense is that they won't come from the type of entity that we are used to seeing now. They won't come from a single pharma company that's developing new products, but rather from a network of institutions that will work together to bring products forward. So we'll still yeah. see large pharma companies, the, the, the Merck's and the Pfizer's and the GlaxoSmithKline's and the Sanofi Aventis's, playing a critical role in drug development, but my sense is in the earlier stages of development, the research, discovery, preclinical, and maybe even the early clinical stages, large pharma will provide coordination and management of the process, but it won't be done internally. Instead, a lot of the basic research, the translational medicine, and then a little further down the line, the innovation aspects of drug development will be done by first academia, and then by some of the biotechs and small pharma companies. Moving later on in the process, I think big pharma will have uh, will establish partnerships with uh, contract research organizations and other partners, either patient groups or even at some point payers in better understanding what types of studies need to be done and then executing those large pivotal trials that are necessary to get a drug through the regulatory process. Ultimately, big pharma's strength, I believe, lie, lies in its ability to conduct these large pivotal trials and then to do the regulatory submission and do sales and marketing. But I think all of these various entities, large pharma, academia, public-private partnerships, patient groups, biotech, small pharma, CROs, payers, are all going to be part of a network of of innovation that is going to be responsible moving forward for getting new products to the marketplace. Because I think if there's one thing we're seeing now, no one entity can do this. Well, it'll certainly be interesting to see how that pans out. So, um, Kenneth, thanks very much for your time. It's been really interesting hearing you speak about this. 
No, and you're quite uh, welcome. I wish you all the best with your uh, upcom upcoming keynote speech at the conference. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it.